I'm going to draw for you the heart. And we're going to actually do a little bit of zooming in now, taking a look at exactly what happens both in the wall of the heart, but also going even further in. So let's start with the heart wall. What, what would you see if you were to kind of zoom in? You might see heart cells, and this is kind of a heart cell with some branches here. And you remember a heart cell, besides just having branches to kind of make it very distinct looking, it has sometimes one, but also sometimes two nuclei. Now let's say we were to zoom in again on this heart cell. What would we see if we, we kind of went further? Well, you know that there are lots and lots and lots of proteins inside that heart cell. And the ones we usually have been concerning ourselves with are the actin and myosin. These are the kind of classic cell uh, proteins that allow it to contract. So it might look a little bit like this, right? With our, our actins kind of spaced out a little bit from each other. I'll label it as I go. This is our actin. And in the middle of the actin, you've got myosin, right? So you've got this purple myosin, and it looks maybe something like this with little myosin heads hanging off of it. And you've got some on both sides. And these myosins are going to be tethered to the wall, right? This, this wall at the end, and I'll draw that tethering with green. This might be something like that. And this is basically known as titan. This protein titan is what kind of keeps the myosin from, from drifting away, you could think of it as. Well, what happens over time is that these myosins and actins are going to start binding, right? They're going to start binding to one another, and we call these actin-myosin cross bridges, or you might hear different terms, but basically the two are interacting with each other. And what the myosin is going to want to do is it's going to want to yank this way, right? It's going to want to bind to the actin like this and yank it that way. And in fact, all of these little myosins are going to kind of act the same way. They're going to want to yank the uh, actin in the same direction. And on the opposite side, you've got pulling in the opposite way, right? You've got pulling uh, towards the middle, basically. So if this was to work, what would happen? Well, at the edges here, these things right here, we call these Z-disks. Z-disks. You might have heard the, the term Z-line because it looks like a line under a microscope. But if you actually kind of zoom in and you, you could you know, go up close to it, it's basically a disk of protein, right? So these Z-disks, if, uh, if our actins and myosins are indeed kind of interacting and, and tugging on one another the way that we think they should, these are going to be pulled inwards, right? It's almost like kind of bringing a, a wall in towards the center. You can kind of think of it that way. And you can kind of think of the actin as like a rope hanging off of this Z-disc. And the myosin is literally kind of hands-on grabbing the rope and yanking on the disc. And in fact, lots and lots of myosin heads are doing it all at once, kind of in unison. So that's why these discs get moved towards the center. And when they get moved towards the center, we literally call that contraction of the cell or cell contraction. And so these actin ropes, uh, if you want to keep thinking of them that way, are going to, of course, they're not going to get cut or shrunk or anything. They're going to be the same length. But these Z discs get brought closer together. So overall, the effect is that the entire thing looks a little bit more crowded because the myosin has kind of brought everything to the center. So that's cell contraction. Now, I'm going to actually take a, a little uh, further zoom in. Let's say you actually wanted to zoom in. I mean, let's look at two of these. Let's say you wanted to zoom into something like this, this white box here, and kind of take a look at what that might look like. Let's see that. I'm going to make a little bit of space on my canvas. But let's just keep that scene like that. Let me start by drawing the acting. It'll look something like this. And I'm going to try to keep it somewhat consistent so you can actually see what it is that we're going to try to draw along the way. So we've got our actin and we've got our myosin. And our myosin, I'm going to orient kind of in the same direction as oriented in the other picture. So something like this. Let's say it's one head there. And let's say you've got our second head right there, right? So you've got our myosin. And of course, our myosin is going to continue in uh, really in both directions. But, but really, it's uh, the majority of the myosin is going to be that way, right? So we've got our actin, we've got our myosin. And the story uh, from the previous picture kind of ends there. But we know that we've got our uh, myosin 
actin bi binding sites are going to be kind of bound up by tropomyosin, right? Tropomyosin is kind of snaking its way through. Looks a little bit like that, right? And it's going to basically be sitting in all of the uh, binding sites so that myosin really can't get in there. And in fact, there's also another protein. We, we talked about the fact that there's a protein called troponin. And troponin is also kind of in the same area. I'm actually going to draw troponin like this. And you might be thinking, why am I drawing troponin in three parts? Why is there you know, a little crescent-shaped thing and then also two little circles? And actually, troponin, even though before, previously we talked about troponin kind of as one protein, this whole thing, is uh, probably more commonly known as troponin complex. So instead of just the one word troponin, it's actually a complex of proteins. And there are three, to be precise. There's troponin C over here, I, and T. And in fact, if that's not clear, let me put it on this side right here so you can see it. So there's troponin C, troponin I, and troponin T. And in yellow, we've got our tropomyosin. So now our picture is looking a little bit more accurate, right? We've got all this stuff going on with the tropomyosin getting in the way of our myosin head. Now, what's going to make that troponin complex move away? What's going to kind of clear space for our myosin head? Well, we know that it's going to be calcium. And I'm going to draw calcium here binding to which part of the troponin complex? Well, the troponin C, C like calcium, is what's going to bind the calcium. So troponin C is going to bind calcium. And once it does, once the calcium is bound there, it then can scooch the, tropo, uh, the, the tropomyosin out of the way. So now the tropomyosin, I'm going to just draw with some green arrows, is going to basically be scooched out of the way. And the myosin head is very happy because it can bind finally to the actin. Now, if there's no calcium, like you can see in our friend to the right, this troponin, uh, sorry, this troponin is not going to bind to the calcium, so the uh, tropomyosin is not moved out of the way, it's in the way, and at the end of the day, the myosin is going to be sad because it cannot bind to that actin. So you can see now the, the myosin, from a myosin standpoint, it likes when calcium is around because that means it can do work. Now let me clear a little bit more space for us, and I'm going to bring up one final point. I mean, if we think that uh, a happy myosin head is a working myosin head, if we take that approach, uh, it's a little bit like, I guess, uh, getting a job, right? You know, it makes everyone happy when they have a job, when they're employed, and myosin heads are no different. They want to be employed. And so how do you employ myosin heads? How do you get more jobs for myosin heads? Well, there are basically two strategies for increasing what we call inotropy, or basically uh, getting more myosin heads working. So two strategies. Let's go through them one by one. So the first strategy would be what? Well, you could uh, affect the amount of calcium, right? You could get more calcium around. That would be one strategy. And the other strategy might be you could have uh, the troponin C. Remember, the troponin C is part of the complex that's actually binding the calcium. You could get troponin C to be more sensitive to calcium. More, and I'm going to put that in quotes because what do I mean by sensitive? Well, essentially, you're saying that troponin C uh, could change its shape or its conformation to bind the calcium that is already around more easily. So basically, bind calcium more easily. But I, I wanted to put the word sensitive because sometimes you'll, you'll see that word and you'll wonder what it means. So bind calcium more easily. So these are the two basic strategies, and you can imagine, you could imagine, uh, you know, increasing uh, in one strategy, increasing the calcium, but leaving the uh, sensitivity of troponin C the same, really not changing uh, how easily it uh, will bind calcium, and the overall effect is more myosin heads are working. So more myosin heads are working. That would be the the kind of overall effect, right? And you could flip it around. You could say, well. Maybe maybe you have uh, the same amount of calcium. Maybe you don't uh, actually increase the calcium, but you do make troponin C bind the calcium that is there more readily or more easily. Well, in that situation, you also get more myosin heads working, right? So in either scenario, in either strategy, you're going to get more myosin heads working. And so these are the two basic 
strategies for inotropy.